Uh, welcome to this uh, Oriental Institute Museums Gallery talk for September. Um, for those of you who need chairs, there are chairs over in the corner over there. Um, and just a few rules and then other rules and I'll introduce the speaker. Uh, so first of all, there are no pens in the uh, gallery. Feel free, of course, to take notes, but please use a pencil. I also have pencils if anyone needs them, so just feel free to let me know. Um, yes, you need a pencil. pencil. Okay, great. Perfect. There you go. All right. And so now that we've talked about a few, few things, uh, I would then like to introduce today's speaker. So, Doug Inglis who, uh, is a doctoral student at Texas A&M, where he specializes in ancient Egyptian watercraft. He served as the ship construction specialist for the excavation of an Egyptian funerary vessel that was discovered at the Abu Sir Necropolis by Miroslav Barta and the Czech Institute of Egyptology. The Third Dynasty boat and its social context are the subject of his PhD dissertation. He is interested in both terrestrial, he's both a terrestrial and underwater archeologist, and has worked on projects around the world, including Egypt, Israel, Tobago, Bermuda, Vietnam, Guatemala, and the United States. So basically he's been everywhere. In 2015, he co-founded Interactive Heritage LLC, a cyber archeology span firm that uses drones to create 3D models of archeological sites, and designs virtual museums for public outreach. Over the last three years, Interactive Heritage has been working with the Kemahemiha, to probably mispronounce, uh, schools to digitally preserve important Hawaiian religious and habitation sites on Oahu and Big Island. Recently, his team has started working with the Bishop Museum to create 3D models of traditional Hawaiian artifacts. So please join me in welcoming Doug Inglis. Thank you all very much for joining me here today to listen to the talk. A special thanks to Tasha, who got this rolling, and the entire museum staff who are making it possible for us to be here in this sort of newly renovated Egyptian gallery. Today I'll be talking about Egyptian boats on the Nile and in the afterlife. And I don't know if while you're here you may be interested in ancient Egypt, you may be interested in boats, you may be good friends who I conned into coming to hear the talk. But we're going to take a helicopter view and very briefly touch on boats, focusing on some of the boats that are here in the museum. And hopefully we can find something interesting for all of you. Now, when we think of ancient Egypt, we generally think of the Nile and vast deserts, of pyramids and mummies, of gods and the afterlife. We don't really think of boats, but Boats are the common thread that tie all these symbols of ancient Egypt together. Egypt is often referred to as the gift of the Nile, but without boats, the massive power to form an empire would not have been possible. They facilitated communication. They moved food, taxes, people up and down from one end of the kingdom to the other. When we think of boats, we think of, there are many uses in the ancient Egyptian world. Uh, they were considered to be vessels of the gods. They were used in funerary displays, in pilgrimages. The royal court moved around the Nile on boats. Um, they were used in hunting and fishing, um, travel excursions, going essentially on vacations where you brought your entire retinue with kitchen boats and everything with you. Um, when the Nile would flood, the cities of the delta would become essentially islands inside an inland sea. And it would be boats that allow people in those villages to communicate together. And the deserts, too, are filled with rock art, depictions of boats. And you may not realize this, but boats actually traveled through the desert. Um, ancient Egyptians designed their boats to be able to be disassembled taken apart on the Nile, picked up, and carried across the desert to the Red Sea, where they would go on expeditions to the lands beyond, such as Punt. Um, we think, really, when we think of Egypt, we think of the pyramids. But the pyramids and the iconic monuments 
of Egypt would not have been possible without boats to transport granite from Aswan or stone and limestone from Tura. They made the monuments that we think of when we think of Egypt possible. They were um, so important in the life of Egyptians that they became um, integrated into Egyptian religion. The gods would travel around the netherworld on boats. Ra traveled across the sky in his solar bark and through the netherworld at night. Um, we see in Egyptian temples that there are shrines for boats. And during religious, uh, Egyptian religious festival, festivals, we see that barks were carried on pilgrimages and even across the water. Um, we have them in funerary transport. Um, and did you know that there are many boats buried beneath, beside Egyptian pyramids and Egyptian tombs? What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a few examples here, and we're going to use them as a lens to talk about a few of these aspects in ancient Egyptian history. But before we step uh, and get a little too far from shore, let's anchor ourselves in time. I don't really have a great handle on Egyptian chronology. The dates keep changing, um, and, and so I can never remember the numbers. But to kind of put this in a framework, um, why don't you follow me uh, through a voyage through time? If we were to sail 1,000 years into the past, to the year 1000 AD, it would be the year that Leif Erikson first set a foot on continental America. If we sailed back further in time, we would find ourselves at 1 AD, 1 BC, the time of Christ, 30 years before Queen Cleopatra had died. If we pick ourselves up and we sail back um, a further thousand years, we are just to the final collapse of the new kingdom that was the kingdom that brought us such famous names as the Akhenaten, the Hatshepsut, and Ramses. If we sail 1,000 more years into the past, we now find ourselves in the Middle Kingdom, which when was, uh, Egypt was reunified under Theban rulers. If we sail another 1,000 years into the past, we sail past the Old Kingdom, past the Great Pyramid, and we get to the beginning of the early dynastic, when Egypt first became a unified state under Narmer. And our journey is not going to end there. We've so far traveled 3,000 years from Cleopatra to the first kings of Egypt. But to get to our story and to find the first evidence of sailing, we have to travel into the pre-dynastic. And we need to travel 1,000 more years into the Badarian period where we find the first models of boats. So far, we have now traveled 6,000 years into the past. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to show the first slide here. We have this is a papyrus boat. Um, and if you would show it around to folks, we'll start by talking about the earliest boats on the Nile. Now, this picture I'm showing you is from the 7th uh, century BC. Papyrus boats were used throughout the entirety of Egyptian history. They were both simple, but utilized and became very important to Egyptian culture. Papyrus is a reed that grows along the banks of the mile. To build a boat out of essentially grass, or out of a reed, what you do is you gather sheaves of it together, and then you bind it together with rope. And this sort of creates a cone shape. That can work as a float. If you combine several of these cone shapes together, you can make yourself a boat. Now, this very simple technology of tying up reeds um, uh, permitted boats to be made of all sorts of shapes and sizes, from simple hunting skiffs to large rafts that were used for even transporting uh, livestock. Um, one of the things that we characteristically see um, when we look for a papyrus raft, um, and if you look in the, for images here in the museum or elsewhere, um, one, you'll see the ends. When they're clenched together with rope, they'll splay out. And that was adopted by um, Egyptian boat rights for even wooden ships. And they would show these splayed ends. And it was a reference back to the splaying that papyrus makes when you bind it. Also, the ends get bent up. Um, and this uh, is 
important. And this first picture um, I showed you is a traditional raft, and its ends sort of dip down and hang down. And we'll see this copied uh, throughout Egyptian history. Another way to do it would be to pull the ends up, and you, uh, you bend them. Thor Heyerdahl discovered this was a very important part of ship construction. He attempted to build a papyrus raft and sail it across the Atlantic. And he found if the ends hang down to the water, the ship will sink, uh, get swamped and eventually sink. Um, Egypt, Egyptians were innovating, coming up with new ideas and um, new cultural motifs all the time. But they also reached back into the past. And the papyrus boat is one of their favorite symbols. Um, it is so much so that um, it became associated with gods, with the afterlife, with kingship. Um, and if you guys switch to the next picture, we have a picture from the Middle Kingdom of a wooden boat model. Now, this is what is called a papyrophone boat. A papyrophone boat is a wooden boat that is deliberately made to look like a papyrus boat. And this was to evoke these ancient ideas. Uh, wooden boats would last much longer, but they would paint them green. They would give them these bent up ends with the splayed ends to look like it. They'd sometimes paint them um, yellow to represent leather that was bound around the end of the boat. Um, and sometimes there's even pictures um, in iconography we see Egyptian shipwrights carefully carving rope into the wood to make everything look like a papyrus boat. Um, moving on, we should... Um, Let's talk about another form of boat that was on the ancient Nile. And this is a sickle-shaped boat. And on your way out of the museum, if you go past the statue and you look on the right side, there'll be a small pot um, that has this uh, sickle, crescentic, what is called a sickle shape or a crescent, uh, crescentic boat. Um, it has a lot of little oars coming down from the side of it. It has two cabins on it, a uh, big palm frond. It has a standard which shows um, possibly the, the person who had it, the city that it was from, or the gnome. Um, and uh, it's one of five here that you can see here that we have in the museum. Um, and these are really interesting. We see these as a new form of boat that is not a papyrus boat. And perhaps it's a wooden boat? We don't know, because iconography is really um, difficult to interpret. Um, they don't show us a lot of construction detail. So it could be made um, from a hide boat. It could be a different form of papyrus boat. But to find wooden boats, we'll need to go to the early dynastic. But before we do so, I also want to talk about um, another um, important artifact that we have here uh, in the museum. This is a, a replica. of This is the Kustal incense uh, burner. And if you want to go see it in person, you can head back to the Nubia Gallery. Um, this is uh, coming from about 3200 to 3000 uh, BC. It has been, played a very important role in discussions about the evolution of kingship and statehood in ancient Nubia and Egypt. I'm not worried about that. I'm only interested in the boats. And the boats have a very uh, interesting thing. We see they're a slightly different shape. They have the upturned ends. But on them, we find the first evidence for a sail in ancient Egypt. Um, now, sails are an unimaginable technological leap. Um, they allow people to travel and move quickly um, up and down the river. They became very important in Egypt because, um, as we know, that the Nile flows to the north. And so the current is going, so it's, it's easy to go upstream, uh, downstream uh, north. But if you need to travel uh, upstream, thankfully in Egypt, the winds blow from north to south. And so you can put a sail on your boat. So it means you can go quickly upstream, quickly downstream. It is not surprising that we see the appearance of the sail right before the unification of Egypt. The increased mobility may have played a role um, in, in the formation of state. Um, it is easy to forget that sails until the invention of the steam engine are the most complex machines on Earth. 
they are a monumental step. Um, it's, it's easy to get distracted when we see beautiful little sailboats cruising so easily out on Lake Michigan. But actually, it's very difficult to harness the force of the wind. You have to have your sail area right. You have to have the shape of your sail right. You need machines, rigging, and ropes to move and con control this. Uh, if you do it wrong, you will capsize your boat and you will drown. So it's a very complex machine. And moreover, it has to not be run by one person, but an entire team of coordinated people who could communicate, train together, and work together. And it is really, sailing is, is really a technological marvel that we see very early on. Um, let us now move to the next slide. Um, and talk about the early dynastic period, which is where we see the first wooden boats. Um, and this gives us a chance to really understand the construction. I'm not going to bore you with that today, but you may be surprised that we have more watercraft from ancient Egypt than anywhere else in the world. You know, you think deserts, Egypt, why are there boats? All these boats are buried in the sand, and they preserve very, very nicely. There are, from the early dynastic period, which was roughly 2900 to 2700 BCE, we have 44 boats that were buried. Now this is a practice that would happen in, in ancient Egypt. Important people, perhaps a king, perhaps an official, would bury a boat beside their tomb. Now we'll come back and circle back on the why in a little bit, but um, 30 of these during this early dynastic period we find all around Memphis, which is essentially modern day Cairo. Um, and these were single boats outside the uh, tombs of royal officials, important people. The 14 others we find in a single burial event outside the enclosure of the king. It is an incredible demonstration of wealth and power. 14 boats all buried together 400 miles south of Cairo in Abydos. Um, timber was hard to get. Labor was expensive, or certainly it was time consuming to build boats. And so they are really uh, on the scale, one of the most monumental features of the early dynastic period. You should know that we are now in a great age of discovery as far as boats are concerned. Maybe I'm the only one who gets excited about this, but listen to some of the amazing things that we find here. Um, recently, Jan Tristant has found six boats um, from, at Abu Rawash. They come from the early dynastic, so they're about 5,000 years old. I had a chance to pick up some of the timbers, and they are hard. You can kind of knock on them. I, I didn't knock on them that hard. Uh, <laughs> but it was impressive, let's say. Um, uh, we found uh, recently in this, uh, the last decade, um, the remains of seagoing ships, weren't, which weren't known before, um, in galleries along the ports of the Red Sea. Um, we have recent discoveries at uh, the port of Wadi Al Jarf, where um, OI research Gregory Marillard is currently working. And also from there is the um, a newly discovered papyrus, the Journal of Inspector Mirror, which basically describes. Um, uh, him overseeing a team of boatmen as they sail up and down the Nile collecting stone and w working on public works and taking the stone uh, to build the Great Pyramid. It's truly an amazing uh, papyrus that tells it a little idea of how it was done. The, the papyrus, the Wadi Al Jarf papyrus, um, and that was uh, uh, recently published by uh, Pierre Tillet. Um, also, we have a second boat at the Great Pyramid um, that is currently being uh, conserved by Waseda University in Japan. And I'm only here because of a recent discovery by the Czech Institute of Egyptology. And we can move to the next slide for this. Um, we discovered um, a boat from the Third Dynasty. Now, this is really unique because I, I mentioned before, we have 44 boats from the early dynastic period. From the fourth dynasty on, we have another 24 boats. However, during the third dynasty, we have only one. And so it makes it unique for that reason. Also, it sort of is a, um, a missing link, I guess, sort of like a Sasquatch of Egyptology, in that it combines uh, early dynastic boat building techniques with fourth dynasty forms. 
Um, it's really exciting because uh, we can look at the way Egyptians used wood, and they, they worked like sculptors. They weren't using math to build these specifically. They were building by eye um, and listening to the wood. They also, we can see how they, for the first time, uh, exactly how they fastened their boats together using lacing, essentially like the exact same way you would lace your shoes. Now, why would you tie a boat together? We usually think of boats being put together with nails. Um, and they're, what's that? They didn't have any caulk or like pitch or caulk. They actually did have caulk. They would use date palm pyres of fibers and they would put it under the lacing, like on your shoe. They'd just tuck it in there. And that actually created a really nice watertight barrier. Additionally, the lacing makes the boat somewhat flexible. So if you're going to run aground on a sandbar, and the Nile's treacherous and it's full of sandbars, um, it, your boat's going to flex instead of break. It makes it easier to ride in the waves, and so there's a lot of advantages. And the other advantage is you can take it apart and you can put it back together again. And remember how we talked about portability and boats being taken apart and carried, whether it's over the cataracts or um, across the eastern desert. Um, Khufu's royal boat, which we're going to talk about next on the iPads, um, was actually um, is, is, is truly an incredible find. Um, Khufu's royal boat um, was discovered right next to the Great Pyramid. Um, if we were to put Khufu's royal boat into this room, it would not only fill this room, but its ends would stretch into the Megiddo and Persian galleries. It's truly enormous. Um, I bring this up here because it was found completely disassembled, 1,224 pieces that were all neatly stacked, sort of like an IKEA boat for Khufu in the afterlife. Um, it took 10 years to figure out how to put the whole thing back together again. They had to try five times, put all the pieces up, take them down again. Finally, they got it together and they looked on the inside and they found little hieroglyphs, little symbols on the inside that basically told them which piece went where. <laughs> um, and Khufu's boat is it, probably our best resource for understanding um, the ancient uh, world. We have a tiny little model, obviously, uh, much smaller here. Um, once again, when we look at this model, we see the ends coming up in that papyriform shape, evoking these ancient ideas of papyrus boats. Um, it had a flat bottom. It looks, it's, it, this model is wrong. It's, it's carved to have this nice, neat, curved hull. It actually has a flat bottom and flat sides. And keep that in mind for Old Kingdom ships. We're going to come back to it. Um, it's not sure if it was ever used. But it certainly wouldn't have been used in this current condition. The way it is in the museum, and you can see on the iPads, and the way that it is rigged here, it has all these oars put on the front of the vessel. Those are actually, um, should all be on the stern, probably all six of them. Um, there are steering paddles. This is most likely a boat that wouldn't have sailed or moved under its own power. It would have been towed by smaller boats. And when we look at Old Kingdom iconography, we see pictures where really large boats have all these guys having to hold on. I should probably not make this my steering oar. Have to hold on to these big steering oars. And you need a whole team of a dozen of them to get the ships going where they're going to. Keep this in mind for some of the things that we're going to talk about later. Khufu's boat, I think, um, I was far more impressed with it than the Great Pyramid. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to go to uh, Cairo and go to Egypt, see the boat. You kind of have to see the pyramid too, but eh, you know. Um, it is really one of the wonders of the ancient world. and. Uh, um, this is because, I mean, when we think about the Great Pyramid is an engineering marvel. So much stone uh, put in place. But really, what does stone have to do? It has to sit there and not fall down. Boats are much more complicated things. When you put a boat in water, the sides compress. They also, the planks will swell. And so you get tension of compression and tension under there. It's going to try to start splitting it apart. And that's when you're not moving. As soon as you start moving and there's waves, the boat starts riding on it. It bends. It's called hogging and sagging. And so you have the boat being twisted 
turned, bent and broken in every single way, and you have to engineer something that is not going to sink, because if you sink, you lose your cargo and you may die. So they're really um, impressive marvels of engineering. Uh, in addition, if you decide you're going to start sailing, you up the stakes because you know a sail moves a boat along nicely on the water, but really what it's doing is it's taking all the force of the wind, it's hitting the sail, and it transfers it down into the hull. So you have to put the mast in the right spot. You have to make sure it doesn't go punching through the bottom of the hull. That's why ancient Egyptians initially used bipod masts two of them together to kind of distribute the force. And you also have to make sure that it doesn't twist your uh, boat apart or turn it over when the wind blows. Um, we can't take for granted the incredible ingenuity of ancient Egyptians. And that's something that gets me really, really excited about ancient watercraft because we can trace them over 3,000 years to see how they adapt and evolve as conditions change, as new tools and new resources become available. Um, if we switch to the very next uh, slide, I do believe we have Hatshepsut's obelisk barge. So I will just briefly show you this um, as also one of the wonders of ancient Egyptian engineering. This comes uh, from the New Kingdom. Um, just to give you an idea, it would have carried two obelisks that were anywhere from 30 to 57 meters long. Uh, they would have weighed about 350 tons each. They needed all these th through beams and 30 ships to tow it. Uh, the boat is longer than a 747. In a 747, if you, let's use a standard measurement, um, a 747 can carry about 56 female elephants. Hatshepsut's obelisk barge has to carry about 176 female elephants. Um, but so we have this incredible ship, Khufu's Royal Barge, uh, buried next to the Great Pyramid. And often you hear it discussed as a solar bark. Um, and this is, a, this is a term that is applied to many, many boat burials um, throughout Egypt. And you should be aware that there is question about whether this is actually that type of boat. The solar bark was used by Ra to sail across the heavens. Um, he also had a second boat to travel uh, through the netherworld. Um, we know what solar barks are supposed to uh, look like. And in the fifth dynasty, we actually have a model of one that is 30 meters long. It's made out of mud brick as opposed to wood. It's uh, next to the sun temple of Nusra. And we also have all these little boat models that are supposed to be solar barks. Um, but this is not supposed to be a rep a Khufu ship is probably not supposed to be a representation of a solar bark because it doesn't have the right ritual uh, accoutrements. The, it has a deck cabin, which you wouldn't have on a solar bark. Um, so what other things could it be? It's been proposed that it would, could be a funerary barge for um, bringing the body of the king uh, to the burial site that then had to be ritually disassembled. Uh, because it had been involved in, in the funerary process. Potentially, it was also a boat that was meant for taking pilgrimages uh, in the afterlife. Um, and you could be uh, expected to go to Abydos or to Butuo or to other places. Um, so there's many, many different explanations, and there's really not a solid answer. But really, what we have to do is consider that over the 1,000, 2,000 years of burying boats, um, with kings, the meanings of these symbols change. Look how quickly meanings and symbols change in our own world. Question? Is there a reason that they found another boat at the Great Pyramid on the other side, unassembled, and they haven't excavated it? Those are actually set side by side. So, so the question was about the other boat at the Great Pyramid. And this is the one that is currently being conserved by Waseda University in Japan. They were side by side. And we often see this configuration in ancient Egypt of two bear, uh, boats. One of the reasons people thought about Khufu's barge in terms of uh, solar barks is they, they knew there were two boats, and you need a day, bo a day boat and a night boat. Also, though, in ancient Egypt, we have um, constantly in tombs representations of two boats, one with its sail up for traveling upriver, and one with its sail down and the oars out for traveling down weather. So there's always um, a pairing of boats. And keep that in mind when we come back to the boat models that we'll be discussing very shortly. Um, 
actually, why don't we just uh, jump ahead to that? So let's talk about, um, I don't know if all of you can see, but we have some boat models over here. Now, after the fifth dynasty, kings stopped bearing boats next to their pyramids. And in general, this practice goes away. Instead, we see people bearing boat models. And it's being done both by officials and by royalty. Um, let's, do we have the next slide? Ah, we have a collection of Old Kingdom boat models. So during the Old Kingdom, the initial boat models that are being made um, are just a model of a boat. There aren't any people on them. And when we get to the first intermediate period, we start seeing this change. Now, the first intermediate period occurs after the collapse of the Old Kingdom. Now, the first intermediate period is often described as a time of famine, of collapse, and of war. But actually, um, as research is beginning to show, it was a time of innovation and cultural expression. And these boat models are one of the first signs of that. We see both um, the use of figures in them. And it's really incredible. Little people who are working the sails, they're operating the rudder, they're um, rowing, they are um, helping to uh, uh, use a fender to fend off other boats or checking the depth of the river. Um, all these little uh, roles. And so we see the people active on the boats, but also we see innovations in technology. And there have been some big leaps in technology that we should talk about um, right now. Now, first, I'll just um, mention these. Uh, these are both from tomb, uh, 2105, which was uh, found in Sedment, which is sort of near the Fayum. Um, they were found in the 1920s. And they probably belong to the 9th or the 10th dynasty. But the, the, the tomb was disturbed, and we don't have a lot of information uh, about it. But once again, we see a pairing of boat models here. One with the sail up for traveling upriver, one with the sail put down and people rowing. And that's for shooting back down uh, the Nile, traveling north and south, making pilgrimages in the afterlife. Um, there's a few things I'd like to point out. One, remember how I said that Khufu's ship was flat bottomed and it had sort of hard sides? This, these boats are round bottomed. Um, and this is going to become the predominant form that we see uh, during the Middle Kingdom. Uh, the, they are exploiting the power of the arch. When you have uh, two sides that meet at an angle, you have a weak point. When you have an arch, the compression is channeled. And so they've innovated this. And it probably comes from having to carry things, on a, something really heavy. I don't know, stones for a pyramid on a boat and not having it collapse. Also, could have, uh, innovation could have come from seafaring expeditions. Um, also, we see a single mast here. And I think if we move to the next slide, Ah, why don't you show um, around that picture? This is a picture of it, what uh, a boat would have looked in the Old Kingdom. So Old Kingdom boats generally had a bipod mast and a really tall sail. And this actually would have helped on the Nile, where sometimes you have cliffs and hills, and you want to catch high winds. We see the exact same sort of sail appear on the Yangtze River in China. Um, however, uh, we also see, once again, a few people standing at the stern. We are now in the Middle Kingdom, and we see a new form of a sail. This is going to be a square sail. Now, it has a, a, a spar, a piece of wood, across the bottom of the sail, and that's called a boom. And it's supported by all these ropes. In the Old Kingdom, the boom was put on the deck. And you and all your sailor friends would sit on the boom while the boat was doing maneuvers so it didn't go flying up into the air. Um, and th there's these pictures of all these guys sitting on them in ancient Egyptians' reliefs. It's pretty cool. Um, here, the boom hangs up in the air, and it's supported by all these ropes. Um, also, you, can, you have the stick across the top is called the yard. And we can see on these models how it's attached um, to the sail using rope. Um, another important innovation in the back, remember how we talked about uh, you needed about six guys on the back of one of these Old Kingdom boats to help steer it? In that picture, there are two. Well, and a very important, uh, two very important innovations were made um, probably in the Sixth Dynasty. Um, they invented the rudder stanchion, which is a post that comes up, and so you can basically anchor your rudder on it so you don't have to hold it up and turn it. And then they also have a stick that goes into it. And it's called a tiller. So what happens is that you now have a machine. Instead of having to do all the work of steering your, the boat yourself, 
you and your friends. You have a machine with levers to do it for you, exploiting force, and now they are able to put just a single um, rudder uh, actually mounted on the stern of the boat. So this is another really important innovation uh, that we see here. Um, now, the figures here are, are very crude, so if we move to the next slide, I'll show you a picture of a similar boat. This is from the tomb of Mechat Re, um, and this is from the Middle Kingdom, where they really have cultivated the art of creating these models. But all the same principles we see are being expressed in the first uh, uh, intermediate period. This is sort of like your beta version of the boats, and then you have um, uh, further improvement during the Middle Kingdom. Um, we know a lot from these boat models, such as that from Mechat Ray. He had 24 from the Tomb of the Jejunox, uh, Tomb 10A. There were 58 boat models, so we have a really good idea. And they depict all sorts of things, anything from kitchen boats to warships to traveling boats to funerary vessels. Um, but there's a boat while you're here in Chicago that you should really go see. Um, and it's an actual Egyptian boat. It's over at the Field Museum, and this is one of the Dashur boats. If you bring up the next slide, it should be of it. Um, this was a boat that was discovered by De Morgan, right, at the end of the 19th century. Um, it was one of five or six discovered. Two are in Cairo, one in Philadelphia, and the other is here. Um, we see some of these same principles. It has a round hull with no frames. Um, it has these little cross beams. Um, they probably would have been painted red. And we see that here, both on uh, the Mechat Ray boat model and on these, that we have these little red cedar cross beams that are part of the through beams, and they help hold the arch of the hull apart. Um, these Dashir boats were buried out uh, side of the pyramid of Sennusret the third in, he came from about 1870 to 1831, according to some chronologies. Um, this is the last instance we have of full boats being buried in ancient Egypt. And everything we know about the boats that will come next are uh, going to be from boat models and from iconography. Now, um, you can see uh, what this would have looked like if we switch to the next slide. These boats would have been originally painted. And so this is, once again, a model from Mechat Ray that we saw earlier. But once again, just keep in mind, this is what the boat in the Field Museum kind of would have looked like with red um, cross beams, perhaps a green painted hull, and yellow. And they found traces of paint on some of, of these boats. Finally, let's move ourselves um, into the New Kingdom. Um, and we will go to none other than the tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, we know that there were more boat models from the New Kingdoms because they found fragments, but unfortunately, the only ones that were preserved are 18 in the tomb of Tutankhamun. This is one of a pair, and can you imagine what the other one looks like? It's the same thing with the sail down. Now, this is not actually from Tutankhamun's tomb obviously, um, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Uh, <laughs> this is a boat model of a boat model. And if you move to the next slide, you can see what the original one actually looks like. It's in the Cairo Museum. Um, this model, uh, which was uh, made by, I'm going to get the name right, uh, uh, John McCann, um, is actually much nicer than the original, which was done fairly hastily. You know, we, we know that Tutankhamun was probably, they took a lot of shortcuts in burying him, and the people that, who made his boats were a, a, a little lazy. Um, they didn't paint them particularly well and didn't include uh, a whole lot of detail. Here we see, um, but we'll, we'll just take a look at it here, and this is, uh, this is a great representation. Um, some of the features that are important. Remember that very first slide that we saw on papyrus vessels where the ends kind of dip down and hang down? Tutankhamun's boat has that too. You can see it starts to curve down at the bow. It's painted green. Here at the stern, it flays out. Remember when we bind the end of papyrus, it spreads out? And there is actually a model of Tutankhamun. He's on a little papyrus raft, and he's hunting with his spear, and has the exact same uh, stern as this. So this is, once again, uh, different than the upturned papyriform ends that we would have seen from either the Dasher boats or from Khufu's barge. But um, it is another version of a papyriform vessel. 
Um, we see, have these baldachins here at the front and back that were gold-plated, with one with a sphinx and the other a bull. And then we see, once again, um, uh, a new form of steering. This is actually how the steering would have been done uh, for the uh, dosher boats. You have two mounted uh, quarter rudders mounted on stanchions uh, with tillers, so that's the same. And we see this fully developed sail. And now this is what um, we are beginning to see. This is what it looks like here. This is fully developed. It's really, really wide. This is the late Bronze Age rig. It's going to be the predominant sail that is used um, in the Mediterranean until a very innovative uh, sail that we probably won't cover today. But you can see it is attached around the post. And then you have all these ropes coming down. Now, partly these are to hold the boom in place uh, and carry its weight. But they fulfill other functions. One, sailors could stand on the boom and hold on to them and uh, not fall off. And you would stand on the boom if you had to switch your sail, if you need a smaller sail for sailing in high wind, or if you just wanted to unfurl your sail and take it down. But really, the function of all these lines is to help when you have this really, really long boom hanging out over to the sides of your boat. As you start to sail and you start to rock, your sail can dip down into the water and uh, get caught in the water, and you may um, take your rig out. So what they do is, like a bow, they bend the bottom of the sail up. They help to shape the sail, and they help to keep those tips out of the water so that you don't um, sink your ship. Um, we see how it's maneuvered, and we talked about it being a machine. We have um, braces and sheets that would have pulled the sail so that they could move it, maneuver it, change it um, to catch the wind. So really, boat models, uh, whether they're from the New Kingdom, the Old Kingdom, and iconography, are an amazing way to study how people adapted to different environments. The Egyptians began um, sailing on the Nile, which was a dangerous environment, but had a lot of different problems than sailing on the open ocean. When they went to the open ocean, they had to adapt their ch ships and respond. They had to adapt their sails to respond. We see that they start working with local wood that is made out of twisted and bent trees. They carve planks in the early dynastic out of local acacia, and they would follow the grain. They would listen to what the tree was telling them, and they would patch all these weirdly uh, weird shaped planks together to make puzzle pieces that would make strong hulls. When they encounter new materials, such as prestigious cedar, and that's what uh, Khufu's boat is built out of. It was imported from Lemadon. It was not grown naturally in ancient Egypt. But they had to develop new te techniques for dealing with this. They had to develop new techniques for being able to transport monumental loads, such as the stones for the Great Pyramid or Queen Hatshepsut's obelisk barge. They keep learning. And really, there's nowhere better in the world than ancient Egypt to study the evolution and the technology of boats. Now, this talk is structured on just a few of the boats that we can see here in the Oriental Institute Museum. However, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, theoretically, I'm um, willing, I will be teaching a class next winter in January if you want to learn more about the nuts and bolts of ship construction. Uh, don't worry, uh, I'm just joking. Nobody would come to that. But <laughs> let me give you a little preview of, of some of the fun things that we'll talk about. Some are all these new discoveries I hinted at, at Wadi Al Jarf, at Abu Rawash, at Abu Sir, new boats that have been discovered that are really changing our idea about how ships evolved and were constructed and were used. We will talk about more. One, I was only able to hint at it here. We'll talk about their role in funerary practice, as well as in the transport of the gods. They were used to move idols and statues from temples around. They would be paraded um, through the city. We'll look at connections between these ancient processions of boats in Luxor and the modern-day Opet festival, where boats are still carried around in an Islamic festival. Um, if we're talking about boats that were used in religious practices, we cannot um, forget the bark of Amun, um, which was built and rebuilt again. One built by Ramses was over 220 feet long. It had a golden silver shrine in the middle of it that held, what? Another boat. 
um, in the inside, and that was used to sail across the Nile. Um, we also should look at uh, the daily life um, of uh, boatmen, what it was like to be a sailor, how did you operate, the songs that you would sing, uh, instructions that you would receive. We have later stories um, from, from the uh, 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 later periods of uh, actually from boatmen where they would uh, write back about what they were doing on the river, what happened when their boat broke, how they had to sell their tunic to go find pieces to repair the boat. Um, we look at how boats were used in transport and hunting and we also talk about the myth, a dirty myth, that the Egyptians were poor sailors because truly the Nile was a dangerous and treacherous place and was a very good place to learn skills as an adept sailor. Uh, we'll go to the Red Sea ports of Ein Sukhna, Mersa Gawas, and uh, Wadi El Jarf and look at the seafaring expeditions that traveled from there and the incredible voyages to Punt. Um, and we will talk more about the Journal of Mer, who helped with the construction of the Great Pyramid, as well as at uh, Hatshepsut's Obelisk Barge. And if we move to the last slide, we can also look uh, where would boats be without a navy? And so we will discuss the reliefs at Medadat Habu, which were recorded by the OI, um, that depict the amazing naval battle uh, between uh, Ram the fleet of Ramses and the Sea People. And we see them raining down arrows upon the boats of the Sea People, and they throw out grappling hooks to catch the sails and pull and capsize the t uh, ships over. And lest I capsize all of you with any more information, about Egyptian boats. I think I will cut it off there, and I will say a special thanks to Tasha and the museum staff, to all the sponsors and the donors and the volunteers that make this very, very special place possible, and I would like to th say thank you to all of you who came, and I hope you learned a little something today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I think we're almost at one o'clock, but we, if you have time for a few quick questions, maybe? Questions. Ab absolutely. OK, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, these models, uh, are they made out of wood? And did they have specialists who made them? And were they always put in tombs? Or were they like kept in a house or something like that? Or were they so special that they were only buried? As, as far as, we, as, as I know, these are primarily funerary objects. Um, they are most often carved out of wood. We also have ivory models. We have clay models. Um, and we see models that are built out of more than one piece of wood. There are a few. Some of the pharaohs had gigantic, you know, 10-foot long boat models. Um, that would have been built out of several different pieces of wood and covered over with gesso um, or painted um, and uh, the individual figures carved and added. Uh, yes? The class you just sold, is it an adult education class or is it a college class? Uh, it is an adult education class. Um, the person to ask probably would be Tasha uh, and she will know uh, the fate of that. Um, Hopefully soon. <laughs> so express interest. <laughs> um, sir. How are you doing? My name is Juan. I'm a, I'm a software engineer with a chemical engineering background. And I said that to ask the question, did the, engineer, did it, did the ancient uh, Egyptians have some sort of uh, school of engineering, some kind of hydrodynamics, uh, structural uh, aerodynamics in, in design? And, This is an excellent question. The question is, did the Egyptians have a, a school of design, an engineering curriculum that could help them design these ships? I'm going to start with a quip. Uh, they had the school of hard knocks. Um, if it sank, they learned. Uh, but really, uh, the truth is, is that this is an art form. It is cultivated. It is passed down from father to son, from master to apprentice. Um, we see, and we actually know a lot about how they built their ancient boats because we have them in uh, beautiful reliefs like the Tomb of T. We see them stretching out lines to take measurements, depth, and angles. But really, we do not see mathematics until the Renaissance, 
being able to be effectively used to build boats. Um, during perhaps, you know, around 1000 AD, people are, are, are planning out frames and using math um, to, to, to shape them and to build frame first boats. Uh, the, but when people have gone back and looked at this, essentially, they were just saying they can use math because they would put them together and it actually wouldn't work. So they were having to cheat a little bit and they were building by eye. And that's really where the artistry comes in. The, the shipwright would have in his mind exactly um, the shape of the boat he wanted to build. And this is really amazing because we have these sort of traditions that are preserved in the world today. Oman is a center of shipbuilding where they still build by eye. Um, also in India and you can uh, in many places around the world. It is really, really a gift. Sir. I have two little detail questions. One, early in your talk, you mentioned the buoyancy of the reed boats. Mm -hmm. What was its, what was, what was the, what provided the buoyancy? Uh, the reeds themselves. So um, this is why, um, so there's, there's a difference between, so here, the question is about what gives reed rafts buoyancy. And um, when we talk about reed boats, we're really talking for the most part about reed rafts. The difference between a boat and a raft is a boat displaces water. You, know, you have a hollow hull that keeps the water out. A raft uses flotation and the buoyancy of the reeds themselves to keep it above the water. So if you were honestly on a reed boat, you'd probably be a little wet because it would, cut, depending on how much water put in, it could, it could soak through. Um, they didn't have uh, bitumen like they did um, uh, in uh, Mesopotamia to seal the boat. So they could have put hide over the outside and if they sealed it, then it would become a boat. They, they, we do have boat shaped um, reed rafts, which is just a whole nother complexity we're not gonna go into here. So, and, so and then my other little detail. Detail. Was, you mentioned that um, when you uh, handled the timber from the boat mm -hmm. and you knocked on it, yeah. it was hard and solid. Yes. As opposed to decayed and pulpy. Uh, Was that solely attributable to the dry conditions? Uh, the level of preservation? Conser okay, the question is about the preservation of the Aburo wash boats, why they were so good. And they can, can be compared with the boat that we worked at at Abu Sir where it was in such bad condition that Veronica and I had to lie on planks over the top of the boat, and we excavated with little squeeze dusters. I don't know if you noticed that in the pictures. She's lying there or, or just blowing things off, and that's because the wood and the rope of the boat had essentially turned to dust. We had to glue everything in place to even figure out what it looked like. The preservation differences are really environmental. They're not hugely different environments, but Ours was built next, uh, was placed next to some tombs. It may have been exposed for a while. One of the things that we found is that the side next to the tombs was way more degraded than the side that was for, further away of it. But that degraded side actually preserved rope, while the other side preserved wood. So uh, it is a fickle environment. We also found like salt crystals, which were as long as the tip of your pinky poking out of the wood. They just rip it to pieces. And so you get a lot of uh, preservation problems. When they found Khufu's royal boat, the timbers were in really good condition. There was a second boat next to it. And they have to go through a lot of conservation because um, when they excavated the first one and they were moving the uh, large stones off of the pit in which it was kept, they accidentally cracked the, the seal on the other one. They didn't have any idea, but then National Geographic uh, eventually drilled a hole in it and put a, a, a camera down and they realized that the boat was um, under, beginning to rot. And so you, all these little things can play into preservation. Well, we see, um, so the question is about um, the 20 ton granite blocks uh, at the Great Pyramid site and how could they be moved by boat? And the answer is we don't have a firm idea on the engineering. We have obviously Hatshepsut's massively built uh, obelisk barge. And we also, from the causeway of Unis, have depictions of column carriers. Those columns could have been maybe about 
10 tons. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but we haven't reverse engineered because we don't have any good depictions of what a stone carrier uh, would have looked like. Things that we know that they would have employed. We found some transport ship timbers at Lisht. They were actually put in the ground to help make a ramp for pyramid building. Um, but they, 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 they probably came from heavy transport boats. And they employ, um, this is later in the Middle Kingdom, but, but they employ an arch-shaped hull design and massive, massive internal framing, just hugely thick wall, uh, logs. They also have um, uh, very thick side planking. Um, and the side planking is put together in what is called a honeycomb pattern, where the weak parts at the joints uh, receive the thickest parts of other frames. We um, also see through beams being used. To, one of the things that you have is um, uh, you know, the ship is getting crushed, and so you have through beams that lock it together. And then on top of all that, the big problem is that you have with boats uh, in general, um, are, uh, you have the hogging and sagging. And so what they did is from the stern, uh, from the bow, from the bow uh, they would run a rope over a series of stanchions back down to the stern, and then they would pull the whole boat together using um, uh, levers to twist these ropes. In some cases, they would use multiple sets of what is called a hogging truss, and basically you're tensioning, putting the whole boat under tension so it can take the weight. River boats um, on the Mississippi, we're still using that um, in the 19th century. And a lot of boats today actually have internal hogging trusses, though the technology is now metal and very, very different. Yes, sir. Um, we don't uh, think they were sealed. Um, the question is, did they use tar? Now, this is a practice you may um, know um, from Mesopotamia, where they have access to bitumen and they would coat the outside of reed boats, but they didn't have the same access to resources in ancient Egypt. To make boats waterproof, um, they relied on a few things. One was to put Underneath the lacing, they would put a bunch of fibers. And as they tightened the lacing, it would get driven into the seams. And it's a form of caulking called wadding. Also, on top of that, you would also, one of the neat things about is when you put a boat, and it's even loosely built, and you put it in the water, you can sink it deliberately. And the wood will start to absorb. And if you've done a water, and if you've done your job right, the, it will all swell, the seams will seal together, and you'll actually be able to raise it back out of the water and have a watertight hull um, uh, until it dries out, and then you have some problems. So, but they probably used, they could have used linen, they could have used other things for caulking. There's actually um, one of the early dynastic boat bo uh, model uh, boats um, that was found uh, at Abu Ghraib. Uh, is a small boat, sort of crudely made. But on the side of it, uh, we're sure that it was absolutely used because there is a wad of oily clay that was slapped on the side of the hull to seal a hole. Question? Uh, yeah. Um, is there any exchange of ideas or any cultural inter interaction between the ancient Egyptians and other marine cultures, such as ancient Greeks or Phoenicians, in terms of having such engineering innovations? Absolutely. So the question is, is there a lot of cultural exchange of technology? Yeah. And we certainly begin to see this really in the New Kingdom. Um, there are uh, depictions of other types of Bronze Age vessels um, in uh, several different tombs. And so it becomes, during the sort of the late Bronze Age, it begins to be difficult to determine who invented what. Um, some of those innovations, one, the, the Egyptian Bronze Age, uh, this, this rig was used all over the Bronze Age Mediterranean. Um, but we see other innovations um, coming into play. We see uh, different sort of structure for the beams that will go through the ship. Uh, we see some different hull forms. Um, one of the things that, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Ulubarun shipwreck, uh, but this is a, an amazing shipwreck that was found. It was put together in a completely different um, form using um, mortises and tenons. And mortise and tenon construction is where you have a 
a socket in a plank, and you have a wooden peg that goes in the socket, and then you put another plank on top of it. And so it's, it's essentially like a wooden nail. Now, the Egyptians use this. They're uh, in our boat at Abu Sir, they're in Khufu's royal barge, but they never hook them together. Um, for the Ulu Barun, they use lots of these, and they peg them in place. Um, and so you have a shell um, that is absolutely locked in place, essentially with little wooden nails. And this is a completely different uh, form of ship construction, but it may have been adopted at a, a later point in time. And we also see the other versions of ship construction, such as there's a, a completely different method of sewing boats that the Greeks came up with. Um, and so there's, there's probably a lot of exchange, but it's hard to know, particularly um, with uh, ancient Mesopotamia too. Um, you know, a lot of big questions. All right. Well, thank you once again, Doug, and please join me in thanking Doug English.